We do not have quorum yet. <coughs> um, once we do, I will interrupt Representative Draskowski to get some housekeeping things done. But I would appreciate uh, <coughs> Representative Draskowski if you can explain your bill for us, please. Which bill are we on, Madam Chair? You're on House File 1030. We're going to start with that one. 2073? Mm -hmm. Uh, 1030. 10. So this is the allowing the employees to opt out of the state paid insurance. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, um, uh, we, um, I, have a, I have a constituent. He's with me today. He's unable to speak um, but he, because uh, he's got a health care issue <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that he's recovering from. Uh, but um, uh, he and uh, likely many other Minnesotans are currently unable to opt out of health insurance coverage benefits through CGIP. And what this bill uh, simply does is it says that um, state employees need to be uh, allowed the ability to opt out. And secondly, that uh, a form needs to be made available by the government uh, for them to conveniently do so. That's the bill, Madam Chair. It delivers um, savings to your committee and delivers, uh, most importantly, flexibility uh, savings for state employees who don't need to be covered by our health care benefits and likely and obviously savings to the general fund. Okay. Uh, thank you, Representative Draskowski. Uh, Ms. Roberts, do you want to walk us through the fiscal note, please? <clears throat> um, Madam Chair, members, you'll see on the um, front page of the fiscal note, there's a total savings estimated in 2018 of $2.098 That's for all funds. And then you can see the breakdown for um, other funds versus the general fund. And then in fiscal year 2019, savings of 4.5 million total. And so the total biennial savings is about 6.6 .6 million. And that is from the um, reduction in medical premiums for the um, employees that would choose not to have coverage. Okay, thank you, Ms. Roberts. Members are gonna call the State Government Finance Committee to order in your packets is the March 9th minutes. Representative Green, you wanna move those minutes? Yes, Madam Chair, I'll move the minutes. Representative Green moves the minutes for March 9th. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the minutes are adopted. I'm gonna move House File 1030 be uh, laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus State Government Finance Bill. Um, Representative Driscoski, you said your testifier it cannot speak at this time. Do you have anybody else that wishes to speak or? Uh, no, I don't, Madam Chair. And I would <laughs> also just mention that uh, uh, my uh, testifier is one of the, of the category of, of people who would benefit from this and he is a disabled vet and uh, is eligible for and involved, enrolled in TRICARE, uh, but with it being paid for by the federal government, he's still unable to opt out. Okay. All right. Um, is there anybody that wishes to testify to this bill? Members' questions on this bill? Uh, Representative Kunash <clears throat> Um So could, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative. So how many people would you estimate would opt out? How many state employees would opt out? <clears throat> Representative Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, Representative, the fiscal note um, suggests uh, 4,000 was the people number of people that they thought might be eligible, and then uh, their estimate of those 4,000 was about 600 would exercise the opt out. I would think that's a pretty conservative estimate, and actually the savings might be greater than <clears throat> presented here. Representative. Thank you. Any other questions, members? All right, I'm gonna renew my motion that House File 1030 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus State Government Finance Bill. Representative Draskowski, you have your House File 2073. I'm gonna um, move that bill as well. And Representative Draskowski, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members, House File 2073 is a bill that requires, uh, that repeals uh, the state subs campaign subsidy program. And members, if you'll remember, this is a program where um, taxpayers, when they file taxes, have the ability to check off on their form and designate uh, up to $5 for themselves or $10 per household or per couple uh, to be uh, taken from the general fund, then from that designation, and then sent uh, directly to, eventually to, uh, a campaign. Uh, there's also a, a, a basic um, um, appropriation uh, from the uh, general fund as part of the subsidy program, so it's kind of a two-piece uh, 
approach to the campaign subsidy that uh, comprises about three thousand to five thousand dollars in a check uh, directly to campaigns um, for all of our campaigns, our challengers, future challengers, future people that will run in our offices, uh, state um, statewide office holders, and their challengers and others. So. Uh, this is really viewed uh, by the author as political welfare, Madam Chair, and uh, I think the people of Minnesota, and I know this when I talk to others, believe uh, that instead of us spending money on ourselves and our campaigns, uh, we should be spending money uh, by, or, or reducing the amount of money that we have by cutting taxes uh, or maybe building our roads out. So those are kind of the two areas I, that I hear as a priority, uh, rather than having a self-serving approach uh, like we have uh, currently one that uh, actually has the money focus on the people of our state. Okay. Um, is there anybody that wishes to testify on this bill? Members questions to this bill? Representative Vogel. Uh, thank you Madam Chair and uh, not sure if it's to represent Draskowski or not but looking at the fiscal note and it says that it's going to free up uh, management time but um, it doesn't appear that there's any savings in FTE and you know, a lot of times when we get these, um, there would be, if, if there's going to be less time invested, you would think that there'd be some FTE. Not, I, I'm, I'm not disputing that I like the bill. It's just a matter of the fiscal note. I have some question as to why there wasn't any savings in FTE if indeed this is a program that's consuming some time now. Mr. Sigurdsson, welcome to the committee. <coughs> if you could please state your name for the record and who you represent. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon. Jeff Sigurdsson, Executive Director of the Campaign Finance Board. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm afraid I have the same health uh, concerns that one well, of the other testifiers had. Um, the trade-off here is that we don't believe it was um, the staff savings would be less than a, uh, a measurable amount of time in terms of trying to reduce overall uh, staff costs of the agency. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry for that answer. Mm -hmm. Representative Vogel. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I was just curious, how much time did it take? It just, I guess as I've looked at these things, and sometimes um, it seems like there's more staff time needed when we're adding cost, but here we're decreasing cost, and it would seem to me that there should be some type of an offset. Um, if Or doesn't it take maybe, I, I can understand if it maybe takes only an hour or two a month or something. But I'm just curious how much time it was taking. Sure. Mr. Sigerson? Madam Chair, Representative. Um, the part of the issue is that, again, it's, it's you know, a staff of nine people. There isn't any one individual who dedicates their entire time to this program. So eliminating the public subsidy program wouldn't eliminate that position. It would just basically be freeing up time to spend on other, other uh, parts of the program, other parts of campaign finance, lobbying and economic interest disclosure. Um, so again, we thought it was a matter of reallocating how that resource would be used. There would not be sufficient time to eliminate a position and have that sort of uh, position savings for the agency. Representative Vogel? Well, I guess that's it then, Madam Chair. I okay. Any other questions, members? Uh, seeing none, I'm going to renew my motion that House File 2073 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus state government finance bill. Uh, thank you, Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, Representative Barr, I saw her come in. I'm going to move. Oh, yes. Uh, Representative Barr, I'm going to move the House File 1418 um, be referred to the General Register. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome to the committee, uh, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just uh, for the record and in keeping with uh, first time up in this committee, I did bring some treats which are going to be coming around momentarily, so. Well, that gets you bonus points for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again, uh, Madam Chair and representatives. Uh, the bill before you today is House File 1418, and it's the Minnesota Lottery uh, Technical mm -hmm. Policy Bill. And this bill seeks to accomplish two things. 
First, it would remove obsolete language from statute that deals with awarding lottery prizes to persons under the age of 18. And secondly, it seeks to clarify the lottery's statutory budget cap as it relates to the lottery's operating expenses, more specifically pension reporting under Rule 68 from the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. With me today are representatives from the lottery that can further explain the bill in more detail. And with that, with your permission, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Kwapik. Kwapik, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and who you represent. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's great to be back in front of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Kwapik, and I am the legislative liaison for the Minnesota Lottery. Um, as Representative Barr mentioned, House File 1418 is the lottery's technical policy bill and seeks to address two issues. I'll begin with the first issue in sections one and three of the bill. In the state of Minnesota, um, it's always been illegal for any person under the age of 18 to purchase a lottery ticket. However, prior to 1994, a person under the age of 18 could claim certain lottery prizes. In 1994, the legislature decided to end this practice and all prize claimants uh, had to be over the age of 18. They amended Minnesota Statute 349A.12 to prohibit minors from purchasing or claiming a lottery ticket or prize. In, in the 1994 bill, however, there was an oversight which forgot to repeal a reference to this under 18 provision that governed how to pay a person, to pay a prize to a person under 18. Our bill simply cleans up this reference by removing it. To be clear, uh, the lottery has not paid out a prize to a person under the age of 18 since 1994 and has been in full compliance with the law ever since. The second issue our bill addresses is in section two. In 2012, the Government Accounting Standards Board, or GASB, issued Statement 68, which required that beginning in fiscal year 2015, all government entities must provide in their year-end statements measurement and disclosure for employer-provided pensions. The goal of GASB 68 was to increase transparency in these statements. The lottery does not have an issue with, the disclosure, with this disclosure in general. However, our, fin our financial division has concerns about the way this disclosure relates to our legislatively mandated operating budget cap. As members may recall, the, our agency is unlike other state agencies in our means of funding. We do not receive general funds, but instead operate from proceeds from the sale of our tickets. Every two years, the legislature sets a cap for what the lottery can spend on its operations, which includes things like salaries, uh, benefits, office leasing, uh, advertising and promotions and other supplies and materials. For the last two years, the cap has been set at $31 million. The concerns that we have are possible market fluctuations on these pension liabilities that could have a perceived in cap, or excuse me, a perceived impact on the lottery's bottom line when it comes to the operations cap. These fluctuations can result from a change in actuarial assumptions used to calculate the pension liability or from changes in the performance of the stock market from expectations from year to year. To be clear, this is a non-cash item. We do not put money in or take money out and has no impact on the lotteries or its employees' contributions to MSRS run by the state of Minnesota. Um, if members wouldn't mind turning their attention to a handout with our, uh, uh, should be in your packets with our logo on top, uh, it kind of gives a little bit more of an example of the scenario that we're talking about. Um, as you can see in fiscal years uh, 15 and 16, fluctuations actually showed less liability for the lottery, which resulted in lower reported operating expenses. It actually makes us seem a little bit more efficient than we are, which in all honesty, we wouldn't mind, but uh, we do want to be as transparent as possible. Our concern is the hypothetical situation in FY18 where fluctuations could go in the opposite direction. And even though our actual costs would be under the cap, our bottom line would give the perception that we are in fact over the cap. It's impossible to budget for these fluctuations because we don't receive these liability numbers until after the fiscal year ends. So for fiscal year 17, which ends June 30th of this year, we won't receive these figures until sometime between July and October. Therefore, it's our proposal that this pension liability line item be defined in statute to not be calculated as an operational cost, so as to create further clarity on our actual expenses. It's a lottery's intent to make sure that our end of the year annual reporting is accurate and that a sudden fluctuation in a pension liability adjustment does not make it appear as if the agency has overspent the statutorily mandated operating cap. 
Um, and just as a side note to members, uh, since this figure is not an actual expense, it has no impact on the lottery's contributions back to the state of Minnesota. So with that, Madam Chair, um, I also have uh, Joe Paul with me, who's the Chief Financial Officer for the lottery, and we're prepared to take any questions uh, that the committee may have. Before we do that, is there anybody else that wishes to testify to this bill? Okay, members, Representative Nash. My question was answered when the uh, cupcakes were passed around. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, uh, we're going to pause here a moment. Okay. Um, members, any other questions at all? Chair O'Driscoll, did you want to comment on the pension piece? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Kwapik's um, characterization, um, to the best of our knowledge, is, is right. I'm not questioning his interpretation. It is something that's been afforded to other agencies within um, the state of Minnesota, and they're just looking for that same kind of language that would uh, avoid any confusion in the future, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to renew my motion then that House File 1418 uh, be referred to the General Register. Uh, members, we have Representative Detmer. Oh, I'm sorry. And all those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed. All right, you're on your way. Thank you, Thank Madam, you Madam Chair. Chair. Representative Detmer. Madam Chair, Committee. Welcome to the committee. Um, Representative Detmer moves that House File 127 be laid over for possible inclusion in the state government finance bill. And Representative Detmer. Ma and Madam Chair, I have uh, the A1 amendment. The A1 amendment. Just to get, um, it in the, get it in the form that I want. Yep. Uh, Representative Detmer moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, the A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Detmer to your bill as amended. Yeah, I'm going to just give a brief uh, introduction here. The Twin City Public Television TPA is seeking uh, some funding, $650,000, uh, as the A1 amendment uh, did for us, uh, for the state to help ensure that they can fully fund a project they are working on for the Minnesota and the Vietnam War. Uh, the project would be rolled out in conjunction with a new Ken Burns documentary. Uh, series about the Vietnam War and I'd like to uh, turn it over to our speakers our testifiers welcome to the committee please state your name for the record good afternoon madam chair members of the committee I'm Bill Straczynski with Libby law firm and I am here representing the friends of Minnesota public television occasionally legislation comes along that hits you full square House File 127 for me is such a bill. I want to thank Representative Detmer for bringing this legislation forward because those of us who served and who were around in the 1960s and 70s are forever affected by the events that took place. Please indulge me a bit of personal perspective as I set the stage for the testimony you're about to hear. We were soldiers once and young, and the past is very much alive within us. Issues surrounding the Vietnam War, both at home and abroad, affected the very fabric of our democracy and dramatically impacted veterans and citizens alike. For many of us, reconciliation is an ongoing and lifelong process. In December 1966, I received a very official looking letter. The letter started out as follows, greetings from the President of the United States. Wow. I'd just been drafted. Soon thereafter, out of drab became my personal new favorite color, and I learned several lessons about life. During basic training, I volunteered to be trained as a medic. I was thinking of duty in a hospital in Germany, maybe Italy, but the infantry, the army was thinking infantry Vietnam. There's a truism around that says the army is always right. And so my adventure began. 
I hit snakes. Holy smokes. Was that a cobra this Minnesota boy just killed with his machete? Does it ever stop raining? Why is it so hot? How many days left in country? Will I be brave? Will I make mom and dad proud? Are we really patriots? Lord, don't let me fall asleep on my watch. Why do firefights seem like organized chaos with lots of noise? Did someone yell medic? Where's my morphine? Where the hell's the dust off? Why are night ambush patrols full of terror and frequent mayhem? Remember to pull the pin before you throw. Why are they protesting? Why do they call me baby killer? Why are they spitting at me? These are just a few of the questions that were in my mind during my tour in Vietnam in 1967 and 1968 with the infantry. And they reflect my personal experiences when I return home. I guarantee similar thoughts and experiences occurred to every member of the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, and Coast Guard. The Coast Guard served in Vietnam as well and who served in the military during that period of time. This public television project, Minnesota Remembers Vietnam, will provide an opportunity for all Vietnam era veterans and our families to tell our stories, to secure our dignity, and forever preserve the public's respect for those who served. Here to tell you more about this initiative is Mr. Jim Paglierini, the CEO, President of Twin Cities Public Television. Mr. Paglierini, uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and who you represent. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Pagliarini, and I'm the president of Twin Cities PBS, uh, but also here representing all of the public television stations in Minnesota. There are six stations that serve the state, and each of us will be involved in executing the project that I'm going to talk with you about. Um, I really appreciate uh, the support of Bill, and as a colleague, as we develop this, as you can imagine, uh, Bill's personal experience really has inspired us to uh, do something significant for the Vietnam veterans of Minnesota. And what precipitated this is that I think we have a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, before us. In the fall of this year, Ken Burns and PBS are going to, be, going to be releasing uh, a 19 hour definitive documentary on the Vietnam era. Not just the war itself, but what our country went through, what it was like for our veterans to come home. And his series is going to ignite a conversation in this country about that stage in this country's history. And it's going to awaken many of the memories, some of which you heard from Bill today, uh, all across this country. As uh, we in public broadcasting began to think about this, we felt that we had a, a, an incredible opportunity uh, to honor and recognize Minnesotans, Minnesota's Vietnam veterans uh, this fall along with the premiere of this series. So we've put together a project, the scale of which is something unlike uh, we, anything we've done in my 20 year history at Twin Cities PBS. The project's about a $2 million project and we're seeking an appropriation and support from the state of $650,000 to support that roughly $2 million initiative. And we will make the commitment through our own budgets and private fundraising to, to, to round out that number and realize the full vision. The project itself will have five components. The first one, as I said, is the Ken Burns documentary. But while Ken Burns is telling a national story, uh, stations all across Minnesota will also capture short video stories of Minnesota's Vietnam veterans to intersperse during Ken Burns' documentary. And this is going to be seen by millions and millions of people. The second component of the project is that we are in production now actually to do a documentary which will air in Minnesota but also will air nationally on the Hmong experience of the Vietnam War, the secret war in Cambodia. Ken Burns is not telling that story. We have, a, as you know, a large Hmong population and many elders who are still alive today who can offer firsthand knowledge and insights and memories of what that was like what it was like to fight in the war in support of the United States, to move into refugee camps and then to be resettled in Minnesota and in other parts of the United States. The third component of our project is actually to take a few stories of Vietnam veterans and work with a theater group that will craft it into an actual theatrical play. We'll document that, broadcast the play and, and offer the performances. 
The fourth component, which is primarily what we're seeking the state funding for, is to build what I think of as the equivalent of the Vietnam Memorial Wall for Minnesota, but on a digital platform. We call it the Story Wall. So imagine if you have ever been to the Vietnam uh, Memorial in Washington and you actually could touch a name and then that touching that name activated and took you in to see that individual, to hear his or her story, to see visual images of his or her memories of uh, the Vietnam era. We hope to collect literally tens of thousands of stories like Bill's and capture them and preserve them on this uh, story wall that will tell the story of Minnesota's uh, Vietnam era. This will involve, as I said, every corner of the state. So outstate Minnesota stations, the funding will help to support that as well, as well as within the Twin Cities. The final component that we imagine is about a year from now to hold an event at the state capitol to honor Minnesota's Vietnam veterans for their service and for their bravery. And uh, it's a big project, one as I said, that uh, we have seldom undertaking anything of this scale, but as I, we just have a once, I think a once in a lifetime opportunity to do something quite, quite significant. The average age of the veteran who served in Vietnam is 68. So a lot of the stories are going to be lost if we don't capture them. And what we preserve on this digital story wall will be here for generations to come to remember. So we're very grateful for your consideration of this request and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, um, I've got a couple of uh, questions. So you're saying the digital story wall it has the cost of the 650,000, is that correct? It's primarily that plus the state event. Okay, and then um, you said that this is gonna be aired nationally. So do you, do your, do you get funding from the other states then that are airing it, the other stations outside of Minnesota? No, we don't. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then you're just doing the fundraising for the other portion of it. What, can you kind of catalog for me the 650,000 on the digital story wall? So how much is that for the actual seeking out um, the stories? How much is that for putting the website itself together? Can you, do you, I assume you have like an itemization of that. I, I could give you a ball, I mean, sort of scale estimates of that for you. So the actual web development work, which is quite substantial to build it, and if you can imagine creating a system where uh, people can upload their videos and, and you know, s upload their stories and send them. So the, the <laughs> probably the web development cost is gonna be somewhere around the $200,000 plus range. We would probably need three or so full-time people to be able to at least to be able to curate uh, those stories. And what I mean by curate them is capture them and tag them so that you could then have a searchable database for um, what's you know when people are going on the site to access that information. Uh, we plan to give each of the Minnesota public television stations uh, $150,000 is going out to the outside outside out state stations to support their work. And then we have a project team here that's kind of managing the whole enterprise. The event at the Capitol, I'm, I'm not sure I'm estimating to probably to be in the 50000 to $60,000 range. Talk to me a little bit more about the 150000 to outstate stations to support their work. What does that mean? So what are they so doing are, outside of the three to four people that are curating the stories in the so web? So they're doing it in their community. So there are five stations in, additions to, in addition to Twin Cities PBS. So each of the stations we would get about a $30,000 grant to have the staff to be able to work in their communities, to bring people into their stations, to videotape the stories, to curate them, to tag them. So it's the, the, mostly the human resource and the production costs of acquiring the stories uh, from those stations. So then the three to four people that you're looking to curate the stories, are those for the metro area then? It's the metro area and then collecting all of the outstate stories as well and integrating them into our larger web platform. And then for the 200,000 in web development, is that a quote that you've gotten from a web developer or where does that amount come from? It comes from our web development team of the estimated number of hours to be able to develop it. So we have web developers on staff that do this kind of work. Okay, I see. Uh, members, any questions? Representative Uglum. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> well, I'd just like to thank Representative Detmer for bringing this bill forward. Um, 
it's, it's really time to tell Minnesota's story in Vietnam and, and the veterans, and like you mentioned, the, a number of the veterans are getting a little older nowadays, and, and um, it was an extremely uh, trying time in this, in this country, and I think many of us in this room uh, lived through that. Um, it, it, um, it's history, and it's Minnesota history, and uh, a lot of a lot of good people uh, sacrificed their lives in Vietnam, and and uh, I think that for the younger generation that wasn't around then, I think this will be very valuable for them to see and understand, and particularly tying it in with Ken Burns, who I have the greatest respect for. I think it's an excellent opportunity to do this, and I I think it'll be very well received. Thank you. Um, I also getting back on the web development piece. Mm -hmm. So those are people that you already have on staff now that currently do web development. So what would they be doing other than web development for this piece? So I mean, part of how we support the staff is through project funding. So so all of the national shows that we do, local shows that we do, uh, there's always a budget item to recover the costs of of your production and web development team. So we, you know, it's a staff that expands and contracts depending upon the amount of work that we do. So they would be presumably working on other projects or would be seeking other projects to be able to, to use the web development team. And then walk me through again just the piece. So you, the 150,000, about five stations, they get roughly $30,000. And you're saying that they will be curating the stories, but then after they curate the stories from Greater Minnesota, then they send it up to the three to four people that you have as FTEs to for them to curate them as well for, for for them to integrate it into our site so they'll be and, and you're I mean you're correct in I think parsing the words a little bit the the curating will happen at the local stations we will still have an editorial review of it before it's published on the website so we'll, we'll be taking stories from all over the state the outstate stations will have done some curation and made some editorial decisions, but before they're published on the wall, our team still needs to review it, needs to look at it, and make sure that it's, a, it's appropriate to the edi editorial standards and the quality of the other content that's going on the site. So there's just another filter it needs to go through before we publish it on the wall. Okay. Members, any other questions at all? Uh, Representative Kunesh Podine. Thank you, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, so I noticed down here on your piece of paper, it, it says that it can be used by educators and organizers. Will there be an education, um, sort of curriculum, a curriculum already created for educators as a result of this project? It's not contemplated. Mr. Aglarini. I'm sorry. It's, it's not contemplated at this point. It'll be made available for teachers to use and to have access. I believe that's correct, right? Right, so it's, we, we don't have in the budget doing a curriculum uh, for the wall. Okay, and then Representative Kunesh Podine. Thank you. Uh, in the digital story wall, will that also include um, the um, people from the Secret War? So those of the the Hmong that live in Minnesota that um, helped in that Secret War um, to su help support the United States. Mr. Paglarini. Yes, it will, and, and a very deliberate and intentional effort will to make sure we reach out to diverse communities. We've put together an advisory group of veterans that really are representative of all the different communities who had some experience in the Vietnam era. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I have just one more. On the three to four people, so it looks like uh, between the three to four people, you're about 250,000 that you're, you're setting aside for that FTE cost. Do you have a breakdown? Uh, is there like a supervisor or how does that work? Can you give us those details or is that something that you've worked up yet? Uh, we haven't worked up yet. We have on staff right now our, our executive producer or the project leader, uh, Katie Carpenter, who's with us in the audience. And so she'll put together a team of three or four people, two or three or four people underneath her to be able to do the curation, to coordinate the, the outreach activities. There's a lot of events associated with this as well. So we'll, we will be inviting people to the station, going out to VA hospitals, working with schools. So it's, it's a major outreach effort to collect all the stories. So it's one senior level person and probably, as I said, <coughs> two, two or three people reporting into Katie who will do the outreach 
the editorial work, the curation, and then there's a team of a whole team of web people underneath that who then sort of take that content and publish it to the to the wall. And Mr. Paglarini, have you reached out to the Historical Society to see if they have some of this already in the can or have you had conversations with them at all? We've had conversations, yes, we've had conversations with the Minnesota History Center. They don't have a, co a, a comprehensive collection of stories, the scale that we're talking about. Um, we've also reached out to the University of Minnesota's Digital Archive uh, Library. And the Humanities Center. And, and the Humanities Center as well. So we have a number of partners also just to be a part of this, but also to serve as the repository for the final work so that it can exist and live on beyond the, the, the one year project where we'd be collecting, one plus year project where we'd be collecting the stories. Okay. All right, I can't remember if I've asked this, so I'm gonna make sure I'm uh, covered. Is there anybody else that wishes to testify on this? Come on down. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. I'm, my name is Jerry Kaiser. I am a uh, Vietnam combat veteran. I'm also the executive director of Minnesota Vietnam Veterans Charity. And we have been involved with this kind of project, trying to uh, let everyone know what's going on. I did two tours in Vietnam. I was a helicopter machine gunner crew chief in the 1st Infantry Division and the 1st Aviation Brigade. And I did volunteer twice to go there. It was uh, a grand experience that wasn't always pleasant. In a 19... 2009, we put on a big program here at the state capitol. And this, again, would be an additional help to that because although I came back to the United States uh, after two tours, I came back once uh, wounded and uh, was greeted quite well with, uh, in my home of, uh, in North Dakota by a, a two-star general. And uh, his, my father was a colonel in the army, and uh, he happened to be there. But most of my friends and most of the Vietnam veterans that I know never got that kind of return. And this, many of them, I'm old, I'm 72, and uh, most of them are younger than me and some older. And they have not had that positive reinforcement that I did. After my second tour, I came back and went to college again, and I was incubated at the university and uh, finished up another degree and got professional pilot's license. But this is uh, an opportunity to go and find a lot more other individuals. Uh, a few years ago, we had the 1968 project where we got a Huey helicopter out here and put it at the, at the uh, historical at History Center, and that has traveled around the country. But there are still many veterans that have still not come to grip to uh, what they were. They've become, uh, they're out there, but we need to talk to them more. Uh, as far as educational programs, the Vietnam Veterans of America that I was the president of uh, for four years, there is programs that I've, I've been talking out in the schools for since uh, 2000, 2001. Many of the high schools and, and uh, junior highs about the educational programs of the, what that's been put out already. So this would be an adjunct to that and just a, a bigger expansion of it because in the event that we did in 2009, it was right out here at the state capitol. We had helicopter f uh, flyovers and other airplane that uh, were involved in, in that uh, conflict over 10 years. And this would just... Uh, flow it out further into the state of Minnesota because even though we had uh, 20,000 people or 15,000 people show up there, they weren't from all over the <coughs> different counties and cities of the states. And I think this is just another, as long as they, uh, we can get together with them. There are so many uh, documentaries. Uh, I, I know I've given a couple of them uh, uh, talking about what my experiences was in my tour tours. And I know a lot of other people University of St. Thomas has a lot of them. Uh, the University of Minnesota has a lot of them. Uh, and I just think this would be a great opportunity to honor those men and women who are, now they're retired, they're old, and they need uh, the same kind of recognition that World War II and Korea veterans have got. 
right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaiser. And Mr. Hughes? Hi, my name is Mark Hughes, member of the committee, Chairman Sarah Anderson. Thanks for this opportunity. I, um, when I'm not here, I'm an executive producer and anchor of a TV show that's <coughs> carried every once in a while on the Minnesota Channel. And I just want to make sure that every member on this committee understands how this TV game works. When uh, they talk about the Minnesota Public Television Association, we have a, they have over at PBS Twin Cities a big master control area that can take feeds from any of those stations <coughs> at any time, capture that information as it's happening, and put it on the air if they choose to do that. So while it's nice you say get, you know, take a look at getting the information from the History Center where they've got that dated material, that's nice to say that, but we want the stuff that is, that is timely and dated, I think. And that's the way they're looking at it. And as far as hiring uh, extra uh, people to do the <coughs> internet web, those people are co-pilots. You can't have just one person do it. So, and I want to tell you that in the years I've been involved with public television, which I carry a small role over there, but uh, they don't waste money. So this money will be well spent. And Mr. Jim Pellerini, our CEO, has spent 20 years plus over there, <coughs> and he knows what he's doing. So please put your vote of confidence to him and the operation. Now, if there's any questions of me, I'll be glad to answer. Members, are there any questions for Mr. Kaiser or for Mr. Hughes? <coughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, can you come down? I have a question for you, too. <laughs> Mr. Johnson, has the Department of Veteran Affairs uh, um, been engaged in this process? Have you offered? Uh, any of the information that the department has, or where where is the department on this bill? Sure. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Ben Johnson, Legislative Director for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, yes, we have met with Mr. Pallarini and his team. Uh, the commissioner is fully on board with this project, and we have been uh, been willing to um, been willing to support them in any matter necessary um, from this point going forward, sort of dependent on the funding streams. Uh, we do have access to some pretty significant resources in terms of history and. Uh, contacts within the veterans community and we're fully on board with supporting this initiative. Okay. Members, any questions for Mr. Johnson? All right. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and I got Representative Hughes. Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative Detmer, for bringing this bill. And to all the testifiers today, I really appreciate it. Um, I think it's very important to give visibility um, to those who served during the Vietnam War. And I um, love the idea um, of the digital story wall and just visualizing what that's going to look like and how it's going to bring stories to life. So I'm just really, I think that's just wonderful. Um, I know a lot of uh, Vietnam veterans and have heard a number of them um, speak to how they felt when they arrived home. And it, it wasn't good. And um, I remember. Um, I'm sure the tears were rolling down my face on a couple of occasions, and so were they on theirs. And just recently lost a friend um, who was in his mid to late uh, 60s and uh, who served in the Vietnam War. Dale was just a really awesome guy. I look forward to uh, sharing with his wife, Nancy, about this project. I'm hopeful that this bill will pass, be passed and signed into law. It's a, it's a great bill. Thank you. Great. Representative Detmer, closing comments? Well, it's just that, Madam Chair, and uh, I think most of you know how I passionate I am about military issues and the veterans' issues and chairing the committee. But, uh, you know, I graduated in 1969 from high school. And some of you were, are a lot younger than I am. And I think uh, I went right down. I was go going to uh, enlist because of my draft number was number 14. And my dad, uh, World War II veteran, he's still alive, lives in his home, and he talked me out of it. He said, go to college, because I had a scholarship to go to college. And I graduated from college in 1973. And I, I, most of you know <coughs> of history, the, the draft was gone after 1973. I entered the service uh, 
you know, after I got into teaching and coaching. That's, uh, that had always been in the back of my mind. And um, served 25 years in the Army Reserve and, and then was deployed for 20 months after 9-11. But knowing that my age group, the group that served in Vietnam, has always been in the back of my mind and that uh, this, the education piece that is with this legislation is going to be good for young people and not just not just for the young people, but for those that had served during this time to uh, really be able to tell their stories. So um, I hope that we can uh, get this through. And thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to have this hearing. And we're going to renew Representative Detmers. He renews his motion that House File 127 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Omnibus State Government Finance Bill. Um, <laughs> thank you, Representative Detmer. Representative Howe. I'm going to move that House File 2164 be laid over for possible inclusion in the state government finance bill. Representative Howe, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, it's good to be back in one of my favorite committees. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, this bill, basically what it does is currently there's a, a charge on uh, dependents to be uh, in, interned at state veteran cemeteries which is different than our federal cemeteries. Our federal veteran cemeteries, such as, as uh, Fort Snelling Cemetery, charges nothing for, their for interning a, a dependent child or a, a spouse. Our state cemeteries charge $750. Uh, what this bill basically does is allows the funds from support our troops, it allows the commissioner to use those, troop, that, those funds to offset uh, the fees for burying a spouse if uh, application is made and it directs the commissioner to to make the policies and to make that uh, that uh, that happen so uh, it actually is is no cost to uh, our current state government but it does take funds out of the support our troops funds our SOT funds to make that happen and with that uh, I have uh, uh, Mr. Johnson here from the uh, uh, MDVA to, to testify. Mr. Johnson, do you have a few words you want to add? Madam Chair, members of the committee, Ben Johnson, Legislative Director for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and we appreciate the Representative Howe working with us on developing a bill that we can support. Uh, we're happy to develop the policies and procedures to make this happen. Great. Members, any questions? Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we had uh, heard a similar bill to this earlier this session in the uh, uh, Veterans Affairs Division, and um, I think that we unearthed some things that really need to be looked at in this, and I really want to thank Representative Howe for bringing that forward and reflecting those things in this um, bill, and particularly members that I'm referring to as a section on the costs associated with this, and that there is no real policy statement at this point by the Commissioner's Office as to how the waivers may be taking place or the, the, the fee structure on this, and developing a fee structure for either in-ground burial or um, columbarium burial or mausoleum burial, if that becomes an option in one of the state cemeteries, there's clearly different costs on that. And if there's going to be a waiver of fees, we should certainly need to know the cost of doing that. So I do laud you very, very much, Representative Howe, for uh, bringing this version forward. Because I think it's, uh, it's uh, on in doing what you want to do, and it's doing it in a very respectful way. Representative Howe, any comments? No, Madam Chair, I, th I think this was a good compromise. It was, uh, I think it uh, makes good use of funds that are already there and uh, to support those families. So. so there's peace in the valley is what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay. Is there anybody that wishes to testify to this bill? Any other questions, members? If not, I remove mo renew my motion that House File 2164 be laid over for possible inclusion in the state government finance bill. Thank you, Representative Howe. Thank good you. to see you. Members, we have our very last bill, Representative Vogel. Representative Vogel moves House File 1936 be laid over for possible inclusion in the state government finance bill. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Um, this is a um, housekeeping bill for MMB, and I'm going to turn it over to the testifier to explain the um, the nuances of it. Mr. Pollard, can you walk us through? Good afternoon, Madam Chair. 
For the record, my name is John Pollard, Legislative Director at Minnesota Management and Budget. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for hearing House File 1936 and thank you to Representative Vogel for offering this technical housekeeping bill. On behalf of MMB, there is no fiscal cost to the bill before you. 75 of the 80 sections in this bill update language regarding state payments to make it more reflective of modern business practices. Most of our state statutes were created at a time when the only way to issue a payment was by a state warrant. A warrant is a paper document that functions similar to a check. The main difference is that checks are cleared by a bank and warrants are cleared by the state treasury. In today's electronic age, most of state payments are issued by electronic funds transfers. During fiscal year 2016, over 90% of our payments were issued electronically instead of by paper warrant. This proposal will update statutory references to acknowledge other electronic forms of payment by changing the word warrant to payment. There are five other sections in this bill that address other topics, and I'll go through those quickly for you. Section four is a statute that authorizes the state to make payments in advance for certain types of goods and services. The proposed change will allow other types of prepayments when advance payment discounts are provided for other costs that are customarily paid for in advance. Section nine updates a reference to a statute that was previously renumbered. Section 13 clarifies that the state is not liable to redeem a warrant that has been determined to be invalid and void. The purpose of this is to prevent unnecessary disputes and litigation. We have on occasion been taken to conciliation court by a third party check cashing company for not redeeming a canceled warrant that has been presented to us. We've been successful in defending these in court. Um, however, we feel that having a more specific provision in statute may head off some of these claims in the future. There is similar language in law under Minnesota Statute 16A.46. However, that statute relates to lost or destroyed warrants and does not specifically address the situation where a warrant is simply void without reissuing a duplicate. And finally, sections 17 and 18 clarify the roles and responsibilities of MMB for state agencies for accounting and collecting debts owed to the state. I'm happy to stand for questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Pollard. Uh, talk to me a little bit more about the section four. So what, give me, can you give me some examples yes. on that? Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee, so right now, Minnesota statute 16.05 uh, allows us to take pre, or allows us to make prepayments on things that we can get a discount. Um, the best example that somebody offered to me was IT hosting. <laughs> um, oftentimes when we go to do business with a vendor, if we are able to pay in advance, they will give us a discount for the state which I think we all understand. Um, we have found some instances where our statute um, is unclear about some particular services that we think we could get a discounted rate if we paid in advance. Some of those examples would be memberships, uh, cell phone service, or lodging. Um, that being said, MMB needs to approve those prepayments before they're being made, and we take several things into consideration. Um, is it a customary practice for that type of purchase? What are the risks to the state? is the vendor well established, things of that nature. So it gives us a little um, flexibility in order to try and get services offered at a discount. Um, Ms. Roberts, do you, uh, how does this get recorded then when they're <coughs> making a prepayment on the budget books? Do you know, or, or Mr. Pollard, maybe you know how that works, or how does that work? Do you know Mr. Pollard? He doesn't Madam look Chair, like he it, does. <laughs> Colin Roberts doesn't know, I do not know. Okay. I'm sure that's a good question. Okay. I can certainly like, Will you guys get back to me, Mr. Pollard? That'd be great. Um, and then just curious on Section 17. Talk to me a little bit about that more. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, the main uh, technical change here is that it clarifies in statute that revenue, the Department of Revenue is responsible for collecting uh, revenues while MMB does the reconciliation of accounts. Um, it's just a technical change in that it's a little ambiguous into whose role is what. I think we all understand what revenue's role is versus what MMB's role is, and we just wanted to clarify that. Okay. All right. Uh, and members, any other questions on this? Representative Vogel, I should ask, is there anybody that wants to testify on this bill? Okay, and Representative Nash? Uh, Madam Chair, it's, uh, thank you for your indulgence. It's not to this bill, but uh, uh, Mr. Pollard, I, I saw you here and I wanted to make sure why I asked the question. A couple weeks ago you were here, we were talking about gain sharing. We had asked for some information regarding the gain sharing and haven't seen that back and um, was wondering if you could give us uh, 
a timeline that we should be able to expect it because uh, I know that's something that both Representative Vogel, myself, the chair, and many others had questions on. So if you could maybe give us <coughs> ideas to when we'd see that. Mr. Pollard. Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, Representative Nash, thank you for the question. Um, to that request from committee, the I think it was last week, maybe the week before, we are working on that. It's taken us a little bit more time than we had hoped simply because we're collecting that data from all of the agencies, boards and commissions, and so we're trying to do our best to bring all of that together, but it is still on our to-do list for the committee, among many other things. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, dokes. Um, all right, with that, uh, Representative Vogel, did you have last comments uh, at all? Nothing more, Madam Chair. Okay. I'm going to renew my, or you're going to renew your motion. <laughs> I'll, I'll renew my motion to have it held over for in possible inclusion. In the state government finance bill. Um, that's perfect. Thank you, folks. Uh, I think that is uh, it for bills. I do want to remind members we are going to have a hearing on Friday to go over the bonding bills that have been referred to our committee. And uh, so we're going to start at 9. And uh, if you're ready to rock and roll, we'll try and get you out of here so you can get back to your business in your districts. And with that, members, we are adjourned. Thank you.